Whoa, Demon Slayer. Episode 6. Wow, jumping right into it. Whole plunge. Very basic, very simple. I like it. No problem. We've dealt with boulders before. I'm ready to cry. I'm ready to cry this episode. I've been so excited to learn about this guy. Kill me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, kind master. By your awesomeness. Wow, wow. Pumped. <laughs> He's so cool. Put him in the river. It feels like there's the Hashira, and then there's Rengoku and Gyome in a league of their own. I'm ready to cry. I'm ready to cry with you. I've actually done the waterfall thing. It was one of the best travel experiences of my life. Me and two friends and our girlfriends had heard about this waterfall that like we couldn't find. And like all the locals we asked kept misdirecting us. I think people don't want it to become a tourist spot. We finally got a lead and then walked through what looked like just people's property, thinking we had been misled again. And then we, we found it. Me and my two friends sat under the waterfall for a while. I have footage of it too, but unfortunately it's on the hard drive of my computer that caught fire two years ago. Episode six, the strong of the Demon Slayer core. You're gonna feel great when you get out though. Wait for the adrenaline boost. <laughs> Alright, this power only activates in really useful moments. After you push the boulder, you're gonna want to get back into the freezing water again. I feel like Zenitsu is a good match for Gyome, given the sort of opposite external dispositions. Oh, he's, Inusuke's gonna crush this. Inusuke also a great match for an opposite reason, maybe. He's, he's dead. He's back. <laughs> this guy might actually be one of the people that makes it through. He's standing out already. He's not your, your average meat shield. <laughs> Even Tanjiro. I was about to say it looks really easy, but it's not. It's no joke. The waterfall obviously difficult, but then even the chanting. For anyone who's done any kind of meditation like this, it's surprisingly hard to do something as simple as just repeat the same thing for a long time. Murata. Murata. He's still in it. I was thinking and hoping that this might emerge as part of the Hashira training arc. To have like a non-godlike character, a normal flesh and blood human like the rest of us, actually participating in a meaningful way. It didn't occur to me that we already had one. I forgot the tail. It's the worst food crime since the udon. It's so interesting that it comes through without ever having seen him do anything. We already got the crying down. Uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of. I do. Please show us your power. I mean, you're like, your actual power. Your breathing. Only Zenitsu could harness the power of loudness breathing. Uh, he's complaining, but he's still doing it. Sort of. I kind of want to do it, honestly. I would much rather do the waterfall thing than this. Oh, that's it? That seems like the, the easiest. <laughs> like, I say that and then I imagine myself trying to deadlift. Overhead press. Whatever weight that is, it would probably take me 10 years. Or actually more like, never. <laughs> never happened. I like once read a headline about a guy who climbs some tall mountain, I think it's Mount Everest, in shorts. Just reading the headline permanently changed my life forever because anytime I'm experiencing some kind of physical discomfort, like cold, for example, I remind myself that there's a guy who's climbing Mount Everest in his shorts. Just by having that upper bound of expectation pushed slightly, it doesn't make me not cold, but <laughs> it makes it a lot more tolerable. I think what this is actually building is not only the core building stuff, core strength building stuff that he was alluding to, though that's definitely part of it and going to be useful for them. It's also mental control. That is sort of a muscle. I think that's generally the point of meditative practices, though I don't think that pursuit is limited to traditional meditation. It's that there's always this sort of current running in our minds. At the extreme end, if you have zero attention to that, it's just going to move you. It's going to do what it does and you're kind of at its whim. Once you realize that while it's difficult to like halt it, you can develop like a, a bird's eye view on it. So you're looking at it. That already by itself is huge. And then with repeated practice, you can start to develop that barrier between like instinctual and unchosen thoughts and your perception of what's going on internally and how you respond to things that are going on internally farther and farther out. So in a sense, you're basically developing your own ability to choose and maximize 
the deliberateness of self. This is going to sound ridiculous, but I've wondered about the hypothetical extreme opposite end. What if every single thought and emotion you had was a conscious choice? Though I have no experience of any kind to suggest that's possible. An extension of that would be like, what if you could will your own insights? You know, like for me, when I have something that feels like an insight, it's not something I'm deliberately trying to do. In fact, if I am trying to deliberately do something, I can't do it. You know, like if I start down a train of thought and I start thinking about the fact that I'm having a train of thought and start anticipating all the good things that might come out of this train of thought, the train of thought ends because now I'm focusing on the train of thought. Ideas that give me that feeling of like, oh, this is cool. They just sort of pop up, which likely means they're running on some channel I don't have direct conscious access to. So on some level, I'm still beholden to like whatever underlying processes are happening, even if I do have the final say on, on what I take away from those things. But like, what if I could get to that, that deepest level of the brain, you know, and I had all the pieces and it was like my choice to synthesize. It's a weird hypothetical. I don't know if it's really useful, but wouldn't that be the ultimate sort of awake, you know, the, the end of that journey from asleep to awake, which is, I think, one way to frame that journey of the mind and spirit. <laughs> all I got left is... Our old friend, from boulder to boulder, we have come full circle. Am I crazy or was four the little little weird dude? I forget, do the numbers change if someone dies? Like, do they move up closer to Muzan? Or is she wearing his eye? That is not good. Okay, he actually looks awfully patient. That is not great. This... Apartment seems highly impractical. Oh, nerves. Her hair are nerves. I don't know why, but I was expecting Muzan to be a mess. If it was me, if, if it was my everything that I've been searching for for how many centuries, millennium, I would be like grinding my teeth and pacing the room with anticipation and panic. You know, like one of the scariest moments towards a big goal is the final hour. That's when your anticipation starts to peak, but also your awareness on some level that you're going to have the deepest, hardest, most painful crash you ever could possibly have if it falls apart the second before completion. He's just chilling, reading a magazine or whatever. I wonder what he's reading. Demon Weekly. Botany Digest. Dating ads. Maybe some sort of visualization brought about by a phantom or ghost. We haven't seen any of Gyome this episode. Oh, alright, bye. I mean, I can't blame them, really. Maybe this would feel unsavory if it was just that they couldn't hack it, if they made excuses for themselves why they couldn't do it. But this feels more like his acknowledgement that they're better suited somewhere else. And let's be real, from what we've seen, it's not going to be them. It's going to be Tanjiro, Enkru, and the Hashiro. The scale is just too too great, given the time. They probably would be better suited training for their support role. A change of lanes can still be forward progress. Things are a failure if you quit the progression entirely. I think this is a crucial detail or counterbalance to this idea that if you work hard enough in something, you'll succeed in something. It could be true, but just because it is true doesn't mean you should be working that hard or giving your all to any one particular thing. You want to optimize yourself in your life. Since you can't know what a path is before you embark on it, you may find out that it's not what you thought, that it isn't optimal for you. And as long as you have that same spirit of not giving up and wanting to improve, that at least is informative in the sense that you've eliminated something. I think one way to look at it, you have a calling or intuition that something is good for you. And you have a certain thesis around that. Like, I think I can make this work. I think it'll be good for me based on this understanding I have of this thing. So then you try that thing. If without getting any new feedback, you quit because it's just like difficult or you're not able to push yourself, etc. that may be a failure. But on the other hand, if you get information, it's like, oh, my thesis about this was just wrong. Time to formulate a new thesis. You have, in a sense, progressed, even though you've given up on this one very particular path. Critical in there, of course, is self-honesty. Like, has your thesis really changed or are you just making excuses? It's going to be... And not just because he's the main character, but also because he's the main character. Yes. Yeah, like you, I mean, you want them to be in the best role they can fulfill, right? It feels like refocusing. That leaves the boulder to you, yeah. And your two friends. And maybe that one dude, Murata. I got high hopes for Murata. A special treat today, salt. <laughs> Seasoning. Not many people can keep up. I'm not going to make fun of them for loving the salted rice so much because when you work out like this, the food is different. It does look really good. <laughs> the crispy rice. Thanks, Mom. For one brief moment, Tanjiro was a mother. Maybe no visualization, maybe just raw brute force and power. 
Gyome is really uh, absent teaching style. <laughs> what does this remind me of? Which teacher was it that's like, you go do this on your own. I'll be here when you're ready. I actually come to think of it. I think that's Demon Slayer. It's the boulder, the first boulder. Again, it seems like a very deliberate mirror of the beginning of the story, but I can't figure out why. It's also obviously very Mr. Miyagi. Wax, waterfall, wax, boulder. <laughs> Oh, he shows up. Oh, it's not him. Why did his older brother not get an earful as well? You can't just be attacking students like that. I don't think. I'm like blinding your little brother. I can see this becoming a vanity metric in this group because they're so insulated. Demon power? Teach us, Kenya. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Tanjiro, the kind of guy to keep waving even, even after the person's back is turned. <laughs> what are you accessing? Bro! Make your own salty rice. It's not that complicated, there's two ingredients. <laughs> it's rice and salt. Tanjiro cannot say no to a side task, though. What were they eating before the salted rice? Oh, they actually call him mom. Tanjiro the kind of guy to be called mom. When Nezu goes in danger, when people are in danger. Go ahead and hit that boulder. I see, okay. Rengoku, yeah, that's a great one. Such a heart of blaze. That works. That's so weird, that's my repetitive motion too. There you go. He's gonna be finished for the days out. I feel like getting it started is the hardest part. And you gotta crush that momentum. It's like a break limit thing. Hey, don't let it stop, don't let it stop. There you go, there you go, he's got this. It's, it's over, it's over, it's over. Momentum. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got it. That first inch is everything. Only 9.89 Cho left to go. This whole repetitive action thing is really interesting, but a bit confusing because it's like a lot of things at once. If I have this straight, it's a combination of utilizing all of your senses, recalling a state, a very potent emotional state that fuels your power, and a set of physical movements, though maybe I'm just being misled by the name repetitive movement. The only thing I can really draw on from experience to try to connect to this is back in the acting days, there was this idea called cards. So like you develop this mental deck, let's say, of cards, each of which is a very potent experience in your life that evokes a certain emotion. Because there is something muscle-like about emotions. If you really focus on them and go deep into them, you can sort of fan the flames of the fire a bit and you practice doing that, trying to evoke that state through that sort of deep dive. And then you apply that to whatever the corresponding thing in the script is for which you felt that particular card would be a good match to evoke that the feeling that you want to evoke. But by practicing it often enough, you sort of figure out where that muscle is without necessarily having to do that deep dive. It's kind of like those moments where you discover a new muscle, like one you don't often bring to your consciousness and you don't have like direct control over it yet it might activate in compound motions or something but like if you were to try to flex this random muscle that you've never thought about before it's initially a little bit difficult so what you do is like you poke it you prod it you start to get a feel for it and once you have that first moment of like oh i can like there it is i can feel the movement i have that link to it now from there it's not that difficult to scale it up to the point where you have like full control over it a weird example is anyone who can move their ears voluntarily without moving their whole face you have a muscle for that but you may not have a link to it mentally you could develop it and once you develop it, it's there. You have that connection at will. I mean, for that matter, going back to the emotional side, once I have a very profound experience emotionally, it's never gone. By recalling it and thinking about it, I can almost go back to the state I was in when I first experienced it at its height. Not always quite to the same degree, but you're hitting that same spot. It seems like maybe this is something like that, but both. It's the mental combined with the physical. Maybe that is the practice, like linking that and practicing that repetitively so much that it's just an immediate boost in power and a lot of the intermediary steps become unnecessary. It's also interesting just from the perspective of the show that this seems like a totally different thing than the the mark stuff so it seems like these two things will stack just in time for Muzan demon to show up
Eh, bring it on. I hope Ubayashiki gets to have like a moment of glory against Muzan. That'd be really cool. Also, I wonder once Muzan inevitably locates their hideout, their training grounds, will he come himself or will he send his floozies? Oh, oh, there he is. He was hiding in the Taisho era secret. Okay, I'm listening. You got my attention. Oh, that's no secret. He's always crying. He's a sensitive soul. He's connected to all things. He understands the depths. Oh, and he's a cat lover. I knew I liked him. Yeah, I agree. Looks like my cat. Oh, okay. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> I was so excited to see him this episode. He was around for all of like three seconds. I mean, we did get his methodology through Genya. I want to see him show up. I want to see the real deal. Come to think of it now, given what I was just saying about going into the depths of the emotions, that does connect with his external appearance, the way, we, the way we've seen him this whole time, in a state of sadness or... Is it even sadness? Like I said previously, it feels to me more like depth. Speaking of honing in on things, there's... So much that we tune out, probably rightly so. I mean, it's probably, maybe, counterproductive for just about everyone to spend all of your time trying to go as deep as you possibly can into all of the current suffering in the world for everyone. How would you even function? How would you do any good at all? Wouldn't it destroy you if you just lived in that state? Again, going back to the book, The Giver. But at the same time, it's a real thing. It's a truth. There is a wisdom and I think a power that could come out of that connection if you can be like in and about it without it destroying you. Like what you don't want is to be totally blind to everything, to feel nothing, to sort of dull the, the pain that would come from sympathy by just not looking, by not thinking. And again, I'm going into a lot of hypotheticals here that may or may not have any meaning to anyone, but maybe some higher form of that state would be you've practiced that for so long that you're never numb to anything. Like you, you have the full picture always, which would include depth of sympathy and despair and sadness, but also you found a way to use it productively. So it becomes a wind at your sails instead of a headwind. That's my guess. Like he's in this heightened state of focus. And so everything that happens has its full poignancy, its full emotive power. That is a source of strength for him. It's like accessing full truth harmoniously. So the tears don't really feel sad, if that makes sense. It feels like understanding, but I'm guessing a lot will be revealed next episode.